All right, hello everybody. Come on, love, join me. We're the Youngs and we're happy to be with you. We came in from Florida and uh, we're happy to be here. So, uh, it's going to get cold, so y'all pray for us, all right? And I think we'll see. Y'all, how, how many y'all like this Tennessee shirt, huh? Isn't that great? That's a nice Tennessee shirt. Got a matching. Isn't that good? The Lord is so good. But we're happy to be with you. Thanks, Pastor, for inviting us again. And I noticed next year you have an Al Stone. You guys are going to need revival after having Al Stone. <laughs> and uh, that's the absolute truth. Trust me on that. If you've ever heard it, just hang in there. But we're happy to be with you. Bethany and I have been married 30 and a half plus years now. We have five youngins. We're the young, so our kids are the youngins. <laughs> Sounds like a bluegrass band, doesn't it? <laughs> Dave Young and the youngins. But our five, uh, four of ours are grown. Uh, Abby and David. Abby's married to David. And see, this one here already loves me. Uh, <laughs> Abby's married to David there at West Coast, where he's a professor. That's in Lancaster, California. And my Joshua is married to Bethany. They have a little girl, Ellie, and uh, he's a youth pastor in Camarillo, California. Our uh, Matthew is married to Kareth. They have a little boy named James, and he's a youth pastor in Birmingham. He's a Roll Tide fan. When you are a Tennessee Vols fan and you have a kid who's a Roll Tide fan, you know what you call that? Failure. <laughs> so, but he's a Roll Tide fan, and uh, he's a youth pastor, a great kid. And then our son... Uh, Jacob and our daughter Charity are actually traveling with us. If you'll come to the revival this week, you'll see them. Jacob is a junior in Bible college, but he's doing an internship with us right now. And just a lot going on in his life. He's got a young lady. He's in love. He's looking for a ring. And uh, it's helping his prayer life. I'm just telling you, it's just great <laughs> stuff. And, of course, our daughter Charity, she's the baby. She's, uh, she hates when I say that. But she's 15. She's driving. And uh, we're, just, we're just really blessed. God's really good to us. But this is... Uh, I don't know where we started doing couples conferences, somewhere along the way, and it's just always been an honor to invest in people's marriages, and we're happy y'all are here. I guess all of you are here, aren't you? Yeah. And uh, I know a lot of you work today, so you're like, I don't know if I'm here or not, but uh, we're glad you're here, and it won't bother me a bit if you do need to stand up. Pastor said, you know, if you get tired, you need to stand up. Bethley leaned over and said, I'm going to stand up, and, uh, <laughs> and I hadn't even started teaching yet, but... We're going we're gonna to share God's Word with you and, and uh, point out several things. I did, um, thought I'd just grab the books. There's uh, uh, several on the table. If you've never seen the, let me get that right, the Extraordinary Series, let me mention these to you. There's two for men. Uh, there's one here called The Extraordinary Husband. This is a mentorship book that I helped to write with several other men. And this is just a, a great book. I think uh, the, uh, Harold Vaughn's the one who compiled all this. I thought he should have put my picture on the front. But he missed a great chance. Uh, you can't do it now because that's all done. But The Extraordinary Husband and The Extraordinary Father are two great books for men. It's written in the idea of read one chapter a day. It takes you probably five or six minutes to read a chapter a day just to encourage you about being a dad and, and a husband. And then ladies, Bethley helped to write these, The Extraordinary Wife and The Extraordinary Mother. And the same idea on these. I don't know why we did this, but this one has 30 days. The ladies get 30 days in each book. The men get 31 days. <laughs> Apparently, guys, he felt like we needed more. So <laughs> I don't know, but there you have it. And then Harold Vaughn and I helped to write this book. We wrote this together, and it's called Home Improvement, Keys to Building a Happy Home. And we base this on the book of Ephesians. These are also written to be about 1,000 words per chapter. So it's pretty straightforward, pretty concise, written to encourage you about having a Christian home. And you know this, don't you? The Christian home, the Christian home might be America's most endangered species. It's really true. And so anything that'll help you, take advantage of it. So these are on the table. And if we can help you afterwards, let us know. They'll also be available during the revival week as well. If you're going to be with us for the revival, we'll have them available throughout the week. But that's uh, the thing, thing I'm missing on those. All right. So I uh, just want to greet the crowd and maybe give a word of testimony and then we'll jump in. Hi, <laughs> my name is Beth Lee, and I grew up in this state. Um, my dad was a pastor in Heath, Ohio, the Newark Baptist Temple. He was there for... About at 48 years. Yes, long time, 47 years, I believe. And so I spent much of my life there. And um, I, I love Ohio. Our two youngest, we moved to Florida 13 years ago. And so our two youngest don't remember too much about Ohio. When we lived here, we traveled all the time too. So they weren't always here. And then we moved to Florida. So every time we come back to Ohio, it's like gray and raining. 
So we enter Ohio today, and, and Jake and Charity were both like, what is with this state? It's like gray and raining all the time, and I'm trying to tell them. It's true, right? It does, the sun does shine. So anyway, encourage them through the week. Just be like, no, it's a beautiful state. Anyway, so I did grow up right here and um, grew up in a pastor's home, as I mentioned. And so my whole life was church and the Lord and the word of God. I heard from a very early age that Jesus loves me. And aren't you glad that he does? He still loves me. Um, At four years old, I was in Sunday school, and my Sunday school teacher was showing us the wordless book, all those colored pages, and I was just entranced with that book. I was like, that is so cool. There are no words in that book. That is so cool. But the Lord used that book to impress upon my heart how much I was a sinner. I remembered that black page and my heart being black with sin. I don't know if you know the story of the wordless book. If you don't, I won't go into it, but you can see me after. It's a really cool story. But anyway. So that's what I was remembering, and, and it was in November, and it was dark outside, because you know it gets dark early in November, and my dad was like, hey, you want to go to the store with me? And I was like, yeah. I was a huge daddy's girl. Now I'm a huge David's girl. So um, I ran upstairs that, to get my preach. coat, <laughs> and it was dark upstairs, and I was like, it's dark, it's black, with sin, like my heart. And I ran and got in the car, and I told my dad, about this wonderful book and about my sin all the way to the store. And when we got there, he parked the car and he was like, so you're a sinner? And I said, yes. I remember the conviction I felt. And he said, do you want to get saved? And I said, absolutely. So I bowed my head and prayed right there. And the Lord saved me, even as a four-year-old girl. And, you know, I've done um, more sinning since I was four than I did before I got saved because I'm quite a bit older than that. And um, his grace, (laughs) thank you, sweetie. His grace has been so wonderful. And one of the wonderful things that we get to do in our ministry is to minister to people like you and to talk about the wonderful institution that God created Mm -hmm. of marriage and to help you and, and to be an encouragement to you, and you all are a blessing to us already, and Amen. so we're excited about this weekend. Amen. So how y'all doing? You're all married, aren't you? <laughs> we, we did a conference recently, and there was a single guy that came. And, uh, so it was a little bit weird, but hey, yeah. Yeah, I guess, yeah. guess he was hopeful something might happen. <laughs> uh, but uh, so I'm just assuming that all of you are married. And uh, just take a moment as we kick off our couple of days here together and think about your marriage. And uh, think about a scale of 1 to 10, and don't say anything out loud, and don't elbow anybody. But just between you and the Lord right now, how would you rate yours, 1 to 10? Your marriage, 1 to 10. You know, maybe there's somebody here, and you say, you know, I'm thinking a 2. Maybe you're thinking an 8 or 9, or maybe you got up there with a 10. But I want to tell you, it doesn't matter where you put it, doesn't matter where you put it, God is always able to start where you are. And he's always able to help you grow. And, you know, it's a process. We are Americans, and we're the technology age and the cell phone age, and we love things really fast. Are you all that way? If I text you, for crying out loud, text me back. Uh, I don't like standing in line. I I always pick the line that has nobody in it. If I'm going to, you know, have to pay for something, give me the, I don't want to stand here and wait. If I'm going to go to the doctor, I don't want to wait in the lobby. Get me in there. Let's go. Life is busy. When I pull in to get fuel, I don't want to sit there in line. I'll move on if there's, you know, too many people. That's why I like Bucky's. Y'all like Bucky's? You never have to wait in line. You never wait in line there. Just pull in. Pick one of the 500. You're easy to go. (laughs) But but the point of that being is that, that sometimes when it comes to our relationships, we want a quick fix. But it may not necessarily this weekend be the quick fix answer you're looking for, but I'll tell you this. The truths of God's word, if you'll apply them to your life, no matter what's going on in your marriage, and you'll start taking steps of obedience to do what's right and to work on your relationship. Do you know the God of heaven can help you where you are to get you to where you need to be? And I want you to believe that. Maybe you're just on the verge. Maybe you're, you know, there's one couple came to our, a meeting we did in Colorado a number of years ago. A couple showed up. Nobody in the church knew them, but they showed up. Do you remember that? And they, they came in. And afterwards, they're like, hey, you know, are you guys, you know, visiting? Well, yeah. No, you, how'd you know about the church? They said, well, we saw this flyer that you were going to be talking about marriage and family, and we have already decided to get a divorce. And then they said, 
But we saw the flyer and thought, all right, we'll go. And if he helps us, we won't do the divorce. I was like, well, no pressure, no pressure at all. And uh, the good news is, as far as I know, they're still married. So praise the Lord, because that have been really hard on my insecurities, you know. If that had ended and now they're divorced. So I don't know where you are, but God's on your side. You know that, don't you? Take your Bible, if you've got a Bible, and we're going we're gonna to start in Proverbs chapter 5, and we're going to memorize two verses together. And while you're turning to Proverbs chapter 5, I, somebody sent this to me some months ago, and I thought, this is really good. And it's supposedly the answers of children to questions about marriage. Maybe you've seen these. The first question was, how do you decide who to marry? They asked children these questions. How do you decide who to marry? Alan, who was 10 years old, said, well, you need to find somebody who likes the same stuff. Like if you like sports, she should like it that you like sports, and she should keep the chips and dip coming. <laughs> like, all right, Alan, we not need to work on that. How do you decide who to marry? Kristen said, well, no person really decides before they grow up who they're going to marry. God decides all that way before, and you get to find out later who you're stuck with. And then the question was asked, well, what is the right age to get married? Camille, who's age 10, she said, I think 23 is the best age because then you know the person forever by then. <laughs> how can you tell, how can a stranger tell if two people are married? Derek said, well, you might have to guess based on whether or not they're yelling at the same kids. <laughs> What do you think your mom and dad have in common? Lori, age eight, said, both of them don't want any more kids. <laughs> and number five was, what do most people do on a date? <laughs> well, Lynette said, dates are for having fun, and people should use them to get to know each other. Even boys have something to say if you'll listen long enough. <laughs> And Martin, age 10, said, well, on the first day, you just tell each other lies, and that usually gets you interested enough to go for a second date. <laughs> These kids are a mess. When's it okay to kiss someone? Pam said, when they're rich. <laughs> <laughs> Kurt says, I don't know where Kurt got his information, but he said, well, the law says you have to be 18, so I wouldn't mess with that. And Howard said, well, the rule goes like this. If you kiss somebody, then you should marry them and have kids with them because that's the right thing to do. <laughs> so God bless him. He's probably a fundamentalist. All right. <laughs> Is it better to be single or to be married? Well, Anita said, well, it's better for girls to be single, but probably not for boys because they need somebody to clean up after them. <laughs> How would the world be different if people didn't get married? Kelvin said, there'd sure be a whole lot of kids to explain, wouldn't there? <laughs> they said he would sound real. How would you, one last question, how would you make a marriage work? Well, Ricky H. Nine said, here's how you make a marriage work. You tell your wife she looks pretty, even if she looks like a dump truck. <laughs> if, and if by chance you're one of those kind of people, you're in the right place, because... Um, we are sure glad you've come to this conference. But let's get started in Proverbs chapter 5, verse 18 and 19. Normally, when we're doing our podcast, I have Bethley read the Word of God, but I'll read this one, all right? I'll read this one. Our kids love these verses. They're marriage verses. And all through the years, when we do family devotions, when we got to Proverbs chapter 5, our children loved reading verses 8 and 19 out loud. And they would always like, do we have to read that out loud? And they'd be like, no, you get to read that out loud. These are great marriage verses. How many of y'all already looked ahead, did you? How many of y'all like these verses, do you? How many of y'all are excited about this session, are you? <laughs> Proverbs 5, 18 and 19. Let thy fountain be blessed and rejoice. Everybody say rejoice. Rejoice. Rejoice with the wife of your youth. Now, what does the word rejoice mean? Well, it means be happy. We could just stop right here and say, shouldn't we? God wants us to be happily married. So are you married? God wants you to be happy about it. I love this. I love this. He says to his son, let thy fountain be blessed and rejoice with the wife of thy youth. Now watch verse 19. Let her be as the loving hind and pleasant roe. Let her breast satisfy thee at all times and be thou ravished always with her love. Aren't those great verses? You ought to put those verses up of your bedroom wall or something there. Or maybe in the living room. The Bible says put the word of God on the walls of your house. <laughs> It's a good verses for your house, I'm telling you. This is, a, this is the Word of God. And he tells us three things about our marriage right up front here. Number one, he says, you know what you ought to do? 
You ought to rejoice in your marriage. You ought to be happily married. Number two, he says you ought to be satisfied in your marriage. That's talking about the bedroom. And number three here, he says you ought to be ravished. You ought to be ravished. I like the word ravished. It's a great word. The problem in our culture is it's not a real familiar word. The Bible says right here to his son, he says, Be thou ravished always with her love. And, and the reason we don't get it is we don't feel it. We're Baptists, so we don't feel things, right? We, we don't feel nothing. We're Baptists. And, uh, and yet you got to feel this word. You ever feel a word? It's like almost like an onomatopoeia, you know what I mean by that? Like say the word ravish, say it. Ravish. See, it didn't do a thing for you because you didn't feel it. you got to roll the R. Ravish. See, smile at your wife and say, I, no, this says I do that. I'll save that for later. But uh, watch what he's saying to us right here. Just, just check this out just a little bit. And watch, watch what he's saying to us here. He's telling us that we ought to rejoice with our wife. That's the whole point. So let's talk about that in this session. This first session, let's take the first sentence there, and let's talk about rejoice with the wife of your youth. Think about that. In other, in other words, let's, let's use this one to talk about mastering the basics, okay? Mastering the basics. The verse says rejoice with the wife. Now, we're going to memorize that verse before you go home. We're going to memorize that verse. So you can, you can uh, know that verse, all right? So give us the next slide there, y'all. And uh, let's, just, let's think of it like this, mastering the basics. Learning to love and serve each other. That's what I want to talk about here for the next 30 minutes or so, and then we'll take a break, all right? Learning to love and serve each other. Now, how would you define love? Do you know? How would you define love? We're supposed to love each other, right? Rejoice with the wife of your youth. Be in love and be happily married. So someone said that love is a feeling you feel when you feel like you're going to have a feeling you've never felt before. How's that go for you? Uh, let's see, I think I've got that. Do I have that on the screen? Love is a feeling you feel. Is that showing up? There it is. Love is a feeling you feel when you feel like you're going to have a feeling you never feel. Look at, look at the next one. Y'all know this one? This, this is one you ought to know if you went to school. Do y'all know this one right here? We loved with a love that was more than love. How many of y'all know that quote, do you? Who said that? Come on, who said that? Anybody here know? That's, a, that's a Bethany knows. She's an English teacher. Anybody here know? Who, who said that? Oh, did he? Oh, there, oh, there you go. Well, way to go. Sorry. <laughs> Edgar Allan Poe and Annabelle Lee. You ought to read that poem. It's about love. Now, isn't it kind of weird how our world thinks? He's kind of an example of how our world thinks. We love with a love that was more than love. If you listen to country music, you'll probably be depressed and get your wife back, your truck back, your car back, and your dog back. Um, but, but seriously, our world, when they think about love, it's really confusing, isn't it? I love pizza. I love my wife. I love the Tennessee Volunteers. I love my family. It's a, it's a hard word to define. And what the Bible, the Bible wants us to know is that marriage is the place where you really can, can get to know love. So we're to rejoice with the wife of our youth. We have to learn how to love and serve each other. That's important. So here's how he says it. Let your fountain be blessed. And in, actually in the context, he's talking about purity. In the context, he's saying to his son, now look, son, you can either go to the strange woman to find sexual satisfaction. You can turn to the things that are anti-God to find sexual satisfaction, or you can rejoice in the wife of your youth and let her breast satisfy thee and be ravished with her love. He's actually talking to his son about purity, but what great lessons for us who are married. Don't you think it'd be great to be happily married? Isn't that your goal? Isn't that your desire? Nobody gets married so they can be, you know, you know, angry the rest of their life. You didn't say I do on the day you said I do because you're like, all right, nobody else will have me. Fine, I'll take him. <laughs> no, you get married with great hopes, don't you? Remember that day? How many of y'all got married? Did you? Remember that day? Did anybody put a gun to your head? Did you do it willingly? <laughs> Joel Osteen said to his church one day, it's the only sermon I've ever heard Joel Osteen preach. And I only heard part of it. <laughs> and I was in a motel room turning the TV on. Joel Osteen was preaching at his church. Just, you know, TV came on there. He was preaching. He said to the men of his church, don't be hard on your wife. He said, she could have probably done better. <laughs> I thought, well, that's, even a blind squirrel gets a nut occasionally, you know. <laughs> that's pretty good right there. But now chew on this just a moment. What he's trying to say to us in this passage is that we have to, on purpose, decide. So let's get an outline going here a little bit tonight. And let's just about how to learn. We're going to learn to love and serve each other. Four, four, four words to give you, and then we'll take a break, all right? Let's start with the word decide. You get the idea this is a command? Rejoice with the wife of your youth. That's a command. Decide, decide. 
Are you married? Decide. Just make up your mind. Here's, here's, I'm deciding to be happy about being married. Decide. Just decide. See, you don't, you, you, that's why you got married. The day Beth and I got married, uh, many moons ago, on that day when we got married, we had decided. You know what? This is love my life. Uh, I, I thought, here's the most amazing, beautiful lady I've ever laid eyes on. And she thought, what a man. And, and we said, I do. We decided. Remember when you decided? Now, that's a decision that can't stop. You still married? Then don't stop. You decide. Rejoice with the wife of your youth. Decide. You got problems in your marriage? We'll start here tonight. Decide. You know what we're going to do? We're going to work on this. Decide. What we're going to do? We're going to take right steps. Decide. I'm going to rejoice. I'm going to get to the place where my spouse and I can be happy. I'm going to work on that. Work on that. Decide. So you're with us so far? you with me so far? So I've got a couple of words under each of these four, all right? Uh, under the word decide, let's do two things, all right? Number one, decide this. I'm committed. And number two, I'm staying. I'm committed and I'm staying. I'm committed and I'm staying. You all know about commitment? Commitment. See this right here? I'm a Tennessee volunteer fan. I said in one revival some years ago, I like to win. This lady afterwards said to me, then why are you a Tennessee Vols fan? <laughs> Now, that was brutal and wrong. You know what I mean? She obviously needed revival. <laughs> but, but here's the deal. I'm committed to Tennessee. I grew up there. I've always liked the Tennessee Vols, so I'm committed. Uh, they've lost a lot of games since I've been committed to them, but I'm committed. I'm still a Tennessee Vols fan. I'm committed. It's a pretty silly illustration, isn't it? Uh, I meet folks that are committed to Michigan. <laughs> Wear hats. In Ohio. People in Ohio wear Michigan hats. And, uh, <laughs> and, and, and what commitment? It's commi you, you understand the word commitment, don't you? I'm committed to it. People can be committed to the dumbest things, can't they? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you can be committed to a lot of things. Bethley's daddy was a big hunter. He's here. He was actually raised in Michigan. And, and God called him to Ohio, and, and he died in Ohio. But he was committed to hunting. Oh, my goodness. When I, when I married into the family, didn't even know it at the time, but I became a hunter. You're in this family. It's a deer season. We're going. Yeah, well, I don't have anything to wear. We can change that. A little visit to Cabela's. I had things to wear. <laughs> and well, I don't have a, I don't have a 12 gauge. Well, we'll get, we'll change that. I got a 12 gauge. You got to use a slug, you know, you can't use a rifle in Ohio. Well, here's the deal. He was committed to it. And dad talked about, dad even watched hunting videos, didn't he? Bethany said to put in a hunting video for entertainment. Watch a hunting video. That's commitment. Guy's whispering the whole time. There it is. Look at that. That's a big one. And, uh, and he just loves He's committed. You understand that word, don't you? Committed. And, and, and are you committed to your marriage? Let's start there. Are you committed? He says, rejoice with the wife of your youth. What he's saying to his son is, be committed to the one to whom you're married. Make a commitment. And here's your word. I'm staying. Do you have problems in your marriage? Did that catch you off guard? <laughs> Do you have some problems in your marriage? Y'all went. Do you have, you have problems in your marriage? Anybody here ever have an issue in your marriage? One guy, one guy said to me one night, he said, my wife and I have been married 19 years and we've never had a crossword. I said, why aren't you two living together? <laughs> Are you serious? You're talking about two sinners living together? Two sinners living together and nobody's ever said the wrong thing? Somebody's dead. Y'all with me on this? I'm sorry. But see, life is that way. When Beth and I got married, this is going to sound like the weirdest thing in the world, but you know what my wife did when she got married? She married a sinner. You know what I did? I did too. And two sinners got married. You know what? Those vows have a reason. Those vows you say, there's a reason for those. What we say is, uh, will you, will you, do you for richer or for poor? How many of y'all know about that word, poor? You know about that one? <laughs> Yeah, we got that one down. In sickness and in health. What's he talking about there? He's talking about the ups and downs and challenges and difficulties of life, right? But the deal is, what do you do with those? You rejoice with the wife of your youth. You make a commitment. I'm committed. That's your decision. I'm, you've got to decide. I'm committed and I'm staying. My dad used to say it like this. My daddy would say, kids, if your mama ever leaves me, I just want you all to know something. I'm going with her. That's a dumb thing to say, really. But all my dad was trying to say is, I just want you kids to know that we're in this. 
we're committed, all right? So your first word is decide. Have you gotten there? Rejoice with the wife of your youth. Have you decided, I'm committed, I'm staying? Committed, I'm staying. You know, sometimes, sometimes you have an issue in a marriage where you just can't solve it. There's been times in our marriage where the way she sees it and the way I see it, it's not compatible. We're not getting there. We're trying to talk it through, and she just won't listen, <laughs> and, and he just won't get it. It's just, y'all with me on this? But you know what? You know what gets you through those times? We've decided. Doesn't matter. We're committed. Doesn't matter. We're staying. I'm staying. And when this argument is eventually solved, or if it never gets solved, doesn't change the fact, we've decided. Rejoice with the wife of your youth. All right? Y'all with me on point one? All right, any questions or comments on point one? Committed. I'm staying. Any thoughts on first point here? All right? Then let's get to the second one, all right? Here's the second word. Second word is do. First word is decide. What's the second word? Do. do. All right, now, why would I put that word in there? Because this is an action word. Rejoice with the wife of your youth. That's a decision word. You've got to decide to do it. That's what he's telling his son. It's command, so do it. But notice, notice it's not just a decision. It's an action. I'm going to do. I'm going to do. Rejoice with the wife of your youth is about doing. So there's two, two sentences here I would give you, all right? Under this word do, I will care, I will serve. Rejoice with the wife of your youth is more than just happy feelings. It's about caring. It's about serving. I care for you and I will serve you. I care for you and I will serve you. Let me uh, think that through just a little bit with you. I will care for you. Is there anybody in your life you care for more than, than your spouse? The only, the only potential good answer to that might be, well, I care for Jesus. All right, I'll give you that one. Good for you. That, that's super pious and spiritual. But I'm going to give you that one. But your spouse is your number one relationship. Beth and I have great children, and we are happy about our kids, aren't we? We wanted ten. What do you all think about that? And God gave us five. We do have a couple boys in heaven, so uh, we, we, if we had God let those boys live, they were born and, and they weren't alive, but if, if they had lived, we right now would have three teenagers at home, and a man life would be busy, it'd be exciting, but God didn't choose that. Now, we're going to get our 10 if we can get Jacob married and, and Charity married, because we're counting, you know, their, their spouses. So right now we have eight kids. We're working on two more. If Jake will marry Anna, we got nine. If we can get Charity married, it's going to take quite the man because she's quite the girl. <laughs> and that's the truth. She can whip most guys and, and uh, certainly I'll talk them. She's quite the girl. <laughs> and, uh, but if we can get all those, we'll have our ten. But, but stop and think about this. The, the greatest relationship you and I will ever have is our spouses, humanly speaking. Our kids are leaving. We're okay with that, aren't we? That's not easy. I don't like the fact that my granddaughter lives in California. Number one, it's California. But number two, it's uh, 1,800 miles away. And, and you know, we can be all positive. We try to be positive about it, don't we? So she's four hours away by plane and a rental car and a few nights in a motel and some you know, meals out and Los Angeles traffic. And, and yes, but I don't like that she's out there. But I'm happy that Josh is married. Got his, he's got his family out in California. And, and they got our granddaughter out there, and we'd, I'd love it if she lived next door. I'd love that. But, but whether she ever lives next door or not, I got my best friend. See? When the kids leave, it's still us. And one of these days, we're going to get rid of charity. She, we're going to get her married. And when we do, she's moving out. <laughs> it's going to be us. And we're okay with that. You know what? You go back 28 years ago, and it was just us. We didn't have any kids. Just us, so we were having the time of our life. We started in a Grand Dam Pontiac. Remember that? Pontiac Grand Dam. And that was our first vehicle on the road in revivals. We drove the hound out of that thing. I remember one Saturday we drove 15 hours to get from one meeting to another one. And uh, it was just, it was wonderful. Those were, the, those were great days. That was not wonderful. Well, okay. Um, <laughs> fair enough. It was a long time. We, we had to work on being spirit filled when we got there. Um, <laughs> fair enough. <laughs> but the truth of the matter is, it was just me and her, see, just the two of us. 
And those were good days. We traveled all over, just two of us. And then we had Abigail, and she stayed with us for 23 years. And, and then Josh, 23 years, and Matt, 22 years, and Jake's been with us 21 years come May, and Charity's been with us almost 16 years. But there's coming a day, so it'll just be us again. What's God's plan? Rejoice in the wife of your youth. That's about caring for each other and serving each other as your priority. Like, how many of y'all know kids are a lot of work? How many of y'all know that? I read somewhere that having kids is like being pecked to death by a chicken. <laughs> like, you know what? That's kind of vivid, but I think I get it. I, I get it. And uh, so you, you know about that, don't you? It's like being pecked to death by a rooster. And uh, it, it's the truth. So I, I get all of that. But, but with all the demand of children, with all the responsibilities of jobs and all the things that come with a life, here's the commitment. I will care for you because you're my spouse. You're my number one relationship. Rejoice with the wife, your youth, and I'll serve you. Now, here's the question, all right? Bethany's going to jump in here. Here's the question. How, how, how can, uh, should we start with the men or the ladies? Uh, how, how can a husband care for and serve his wife to rejoice, to make a marriage happy? What can a husband do to care for and serve his wife? What can a wife do to care for and serve her husband? How would you answer that? Well, gentlemen, I don't really like to address you all, but <laughs> my husband said, hey, I'm going to ask you this question, and so I am going to submit right now. Um, the, the passage does say that you rejoice with your wife. That seems to indicate that both of you are happy at the same time. Now, that can be a little difficult in a marriage, right? I know that sometimes in our marriage, David is blissfully going on about life, and I'm not so blissfully going about life. And, you know, until we communicate, he doesn't even know that there's no bliss on this end. So I would say, first of all, ladies, this is a lesson to us that we communicate. There is a verse in 1 Peter chapter 3 that addresses the husbands, and it says that are, the husbands are to dwell with their wives according to knowledge. And you may hit on this later, I don't know, but um, your husband doesn't just automatically have that knowledge of what makes you happy, what makes you in a mood to rejoice with him. So probably, ladies, this would take some communication on your part, and that way your husband can dwell with you according to knowledge. He can be like, you know what? My wife likes chocolate. I'm going to buy some chocolate. That will cause some rejoicing in the house. Um, it could be flowers. <laughs> it could be time together. Many of you have probably read the books, The Five Love Languages. Have you read that book? It's a wonderful book by Dr. Chapman, right? Yes. Gary Chapman. And um, if you haven't read it, you probably should. It goes through and it talks about all the different ways that we show love to one another or we receive love from one another. And I will tell you guys, most women are multilingual. Like one day you'll come home and she'll be like, I really could use some acts of service right now. And you're like, hey, I got the vacuum. I've got it. I can do the dishes. And that just shows her all kinds of love. And the next day you might come home and she'll be like, where's my present? You know, <laughs> honestly, girls, we shouldn't be like that. Don't be high maintenance like that. I'm, I'm being a little facetious. But you can dwell with your wife according to knowledge. You can rejoice with her by getting to know her. You don't have to get to know every lady in this room. Aren't you glad? Amen. You don't have to get to know all the ladies in the church but you do have to get to know her, and she's probably different than your mom. What your mom was like, this is Let's awesome. So. I, <laughs> this is how my husband shows love to me. Just because your daddy showed love in a certain way, that's not the same way that your wife will want to receive love from you. So think of different ways. Maybe study her in this next week. If you've noticed your wife hasn't done a lot of rejoicing lately, you're coming home and she's just like, her whole day is on her face and her whole day is like staring at you like, mm, mm. And you're like, okay, how can I help my wife to rejoice with me? Well, do a little study and, and just observe That's her good. and ask her, how can I serve you? How can I care about you right now? And then ladies, ladies, I, 
When David asked me this, I was thinking of the verse in Ephesians chapter 5. I think it's the, the last verse of the chapter. It says, the wife see that she reverence her husband. That word reverence is, is the word respect. It actually means to hold him in awe. It, it almost is the same word that is used in the Old Testament when it talks about the fear of the Lord. Not that you're afraid of your husband, but you know how that you are in such awe of the Lord, at least I hope you're in awe of God and all the amazing things he does for us. We're supposed to feel that for our husbands. Wow. Now, our husbands are fallible. They are just human. So they will make mistakes, not like the Lord at all. But if he's walking with God, what a wonderful thing. Even if he's not walking with God, he is the man that God has given to you. So that word, reverence your husband, hold him in awe. Don't just hold him in awe in your heart and think, wow, that was pretty amazing. Actually let it come out of your mouth. Caring for your husband Serving your husband, I think, is very verbal. It needs to come out of your mouth. He, he may not get built up anywhere else. Maybe not at work. Maybe not at church. Maybe not when he's hanging with his buds. And certainly not in our culture. And, and not a lot in our culture when he's out and about. But when he comes home, you should be his biggest cheerleader. When he walks in the door... Caring for him and serving for him is not pouring out your day right away when he walks in the door. You will not believe what your children did today. You know, maybe he'll ask you and you can tell him. But, but usually that's our first thing, right? Oh my goodness, there's an adult I can talk to. Please come in here and let me share my day with you. Um, but reverencing him, holding him in awe, caring for him and serving him in that way. Serving him in the way that... Can I say that in our culture is, is considered archaic? You know, the little lady who's at home, who gets her husband a drink, who makes sure he is comfortable, who makes him a dinner. Oh my goodness, how horrible would that be? No, that's not horrible at all. That's just serving. It's just serving. Your husband can get you a drink. Why can't you get him a drink? Honey, would you like a cup of coffee? Can I fix you a Coke Zero? <laughs> what, what snack can I bring you? What can I do for you? Those are all acts of service that are very valid, that in our culture, it's like, what are you, some little doormat? No, you're not a doormat. You are showing love and care and service to your husband. So there's just a few ideas. Sure. If you study your husband, I'm sure you can come up with a lot more. So notice the phrase there, I will care, I will serve. Rejoice with the wife of your youth. We just care for each other. It's not to be weird. You know, there may be something she said, and you're like, I don't think we're kind of that way. But all of us all know the number one person you ought to know that cares about you is your spouse. And, and the number one person that, that knows that someone cares about them should go both ways. Bethany needs to know that I care about her, and I need to know she cares about me. We need to work at that. It's rejoicing with the wife of your youth. And isn't that why you got married? Remember when you first started dating? When you first started dating, you were amazed by him, weren't you? You were like, he is such a stallion. <laughs> and you're like, he gets the door for me, and he's so nice, and my goodness, he says thank you, and he's got manners that he knew not of, and, and just all this stuff. And you were so impressed, you were in awe. And then, then how were you guys? You were like, my word, she's amazing. She just, she's, she talks all the time, and she's just so amazing. <laughs> she's just happy to be around. And honestly, you know what the enemy wants to do in your life? He wants you to miss this first sentence in Proverbs 5. Rejoice with the wife of your youth. He wants you just to get over it, to where you bear with one another. Not that you enjoy being married. So you've got to decide. I'm committed. I'm committed. I'm staying. you got to do. I'm caring and I'm serving. Two other words, and let's take a break. And the next word is the word destroy. Or, no, the word develop, actually. The word develop. The word develop. <laughs> The word develop, all right? And here's two sentences for you. Let me just give them to you quickly. Develop, all right? Number one, I will continue. And number two, I will sob. What I mean by continue, rejoice with the wife of your youth is not a once and done. Does that make sense to you? It's not a one time and done. It's an over and over. It's like eating. You don't just eat once. Okay, I'm done. I'm, I've eaten. I'm all, it's all ever I'm going to do. 
No, you'll eat again. You know, somebody said uh, earlier, how I many of y'all ate beforehand? I mean, oh, some of you are eating before and after. Well, there's nothing wrong with that, right? That's not a bad idea at all. Eat before and after. We don't eat because we're hungry. We're Americans, right? <laughs> Who's hungry? What's that got to do with it? We see, because we like it. There's potato chips. Bring them on. And y'all with me on this? We, we're blessed. See, you just keep eating. So you're married, are you? So keep at it. In other words, I'll continue. I'm going to continue to say I love you. Did you get the door for when you're dating? Continue that. Were you flirty? Keep it up. Did you wink at each other across the room? Well, wink some more. Did you ever send flirty texts? Well, send some more. Did you ever write a love letter? Write another one. See, I, I will develop this. I will continue to grow, to learn, to, to love. And, and it also means I will solve. If I'm going to rejoice with the wife of my youth and we're living in a sin-cursed world, you know what we have to do? We have to develop solutions. I will solve, and I wrote it in my notes like this, anything that needs to be corrected, anything that needs my attention, and anything that needs to change. If I become aware of something in my life that ought to be corrected, and I don't correct it, you know what I'm doing? Damaging my relationship. But if I'm aware, and this would be silly about it. how silly could we be? If I'm aware that my wife wants the toilet seat down, well, why wouldn't I do the hard thing and put the toilet seat down? I mean, is that dumb or what? I mean, so we, get, we get so tight about stupid things, don't we? And, uh, and, and, you know, if she likes my socks in the, you know, the laundry basket for crying out loud, Put them in the laundry basket. I can correct that easily. Y'all see how simple that is? It's so, it's so easy to overlook the little things that just the, the enemy will use to terrorize your marriage. Don't let that happen. You've got to be willing to solve anything, anything that needs to be corrected, anything that needs your attention, or anything that you ought to change. Just do it. Why? Because you're to rejoice with the wife of your youth. So, so continue. Continue growing and continue solving problems. If there's any issue at all in your marriage tonight, you know God's plan for that is that you grow and solve it. Every issue you'll face in marriage, God wants you to develop. You got to grow. You got to solve. You got to keep going, keep growing. And it is God's plan. You all know this, don't you? That every year that you're married, that you're more in love than you were the last year. That is God's plan. Love doesn't stay sad. Do you all know that, don't you? Love either declines, it diminishes, or it increases. It grows. And happy is the marriage where love is growing. You don't stay the same. Aren't you glad you're not newlyweds anymore? You're beyond that. And here's what our culture is. And even in the church, we're like, oh, my goodness, oh, my goodness. Look at those, they're newlyweds, that puppy love. And we'll say things like, oh, they'll get over it. Well, why? Why get over it? Why do we have to be like, okay, well, they're newlyweds, so you expect them to all hug up in church? But we're married. We don't do that. Look at them holding hands. You know, they're newlyweds. We don't do that. Well, why not? See how simple this is? Rejoice with the wife of your youth. Doesn't just happen. But I'll tell you, you can decide, and you can do, and you can develop, and then there's the last word, and it is the word destroy, so it is the right word. How do you rejoice with the wife of your youth? you got to destroy. Two, two sentences there means I'll cancel, and I will seek. You know what you got to do when you're going to have a happy marriage? You got to be willing to cancel envy and cancel rudeness and cancel arrogance and cancel anger. You got to cancel the failures of your spouse. You know about the word cancel, don't you? We're good at that in our culture. We live in a cancel culture to where if we don't like something, we will cancel you. We'll do all we can to shut you down, to shut you out, to get rid of you. Well, well, there are things we ought to cancel. Uh, someone said that true love forgives failure and doesn't record failure. A lot of people in our culture records failure rather than forgives failure. Your spouse is going to fail at times. What you do, you forgive. Don't record that. Forgive that. Wrongs in the past should never equal wounds in the present. God doesn't intend for the wrongs of our past to be the wounds of our present because God offers us healing. God's plan is that all the wounds of your past get healed or all the, all the wrongs of your past get healed so that you don't carry a wound the rest of your life. Wounds do heal, don't you? I'm a motorcycle guy. Any motorcycle guys in the room? Some years ago, I borrowed my, my friend's 900 Ducati and went for a ride, and I was revving that thing pretty good. It's a nice little bike, beautiful little bike. 
I came around this curve and leveled out on this straightaway at about 65 when deer ran out in the road in front of me. And I laid that bike over. I went sliding down the, the, the highway there. I damaged a helmet and a leather coat and tore the side off a pair of leather boots and took the height off my knee and broke my hand. And I got up and if I'd have had a gun, I'd have killed five deer on the spot. <laughs> I'd have shot every one of them. I was so mad. I'm like, can you believe stupid deer went out in front of me? And I laid the bike over and missed the deer. But you know what? I got a little wound there. I got a, got a, it was a little, little damage. I had, I, I, my, knee, my knee, you could see, I mean, nothing but raw meat there. It was beautiful. And uh, I, I knew I needed to clean that out because I had some gravel in there. So I went to Target and bought some of that antiseptic spray. And uh, I wasn't thinking clearly because I think I was in shock. And my teenage son was with me and, and could have stopped it, but no. <laughs> no, let Dad do it. I went out there beside the truck. I hadn't told my wife yet that I'd hurt myself. Didn't know my hand was broken. I just knew it was swelling. And I pulled that can of antiseptic spray out and that raw meat on my knee. I sprayed that baby down. I also levitated. <laughs> and uh, scared people in about a three-mile radius with the response. Let's see, that, 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 that was a wrong, but I, I, I don't live by that. I'm not like the rest of my life walking around with that wound ruining my life. Don't let anything hurt your marriage. Face it, cancel all the wrongs, deal with them, correct them, cancel all the wrongs because you got to seek, you got to seek that which is good. You cancel so you can seek. And 1 Corinthians 13 is a text you ought to memorize or, or meditate on some this weekend and let's, let's just throw this at you and, and, and take our break. Paul said there that charity or love in action is patient and kind. It's not envious or boastful or arrogant. It bears all, meaning that it protects. It believes all, which means it believes the best. It believes the best. I'm to believe the best about Bethlehem. Love endures things, circumstances. What's the point he's making to his son in Proverbs 5? You know what God wants in our marriages? He wants us to rejoice, to be deliriously happy. How many of y'all know that's not automatic? It never is. But I'm giving you four words there to help you get started to rejoicing. You've got to decide, and then do, and develop, and destroy. Remember Song of Solomon, those little foxes that spoil the vine? Song of Solomon chapter 2. If it's little, deal with it so it doesn't hurt you. I'll tell you, life is always amazingly good when all is well right here in our life. When all is well between Bethlehem and me, Pastor, life's just really great. I can face anything. When all is well between, you know, people say, how in the world you've been on the road for 30 years, and travel to several thousand churches, and miles and miles, and RVs. And how'd you do that? Because all was well. We did it together. We rejoice together serving the Lord. And that's what God wants from you. Questions, comments, otherwise snide remarks? Anything you'd add? All right. Anything, question or comment? We'll take a break and fellowship a little bit and have one more session and call it a Friday night. Anything at all? Any question is valid. Doesn't mean we'll answer, but it's valid. <laughs> Any question at all? All right. Pastor, you want to just give us a break? Is that what you're going to